So my name is Ray DeMonico. I'm Director of Education Policy at the Manhattan Institute. On behalf of the Institute and its trustees, I, I welcome you here today and thank you for making time uh, to join us. I think we have a very interesting uh, discussion uh, planned for you. I hope so, at least. Uh, we're here to discuss the role of charter schools in New York City public education. It's actually 20 years ago this month that New York State adopted a law allowing the creation of charter schools, a new type of public school, publicly financed through a per-pupil allotment, but operated independently of the local school board and district. Slow at first, the charter school sector grew rapidly during the administration of Mayor Bloomberg. Charter schools now educate 120,000 students in New York City, about 10% of the city's public school enrollment, and they are expected to continue to grow. Each year, new charter schools come online. Though well established, the future of charter schools, particularly their growth, remains a hot topic of policy debate in New York City and New York State. The enabling law for charter schools in the state caps the number of charter schools that, that can be opened with separate caps for the city and the rest of the state. The numbers change rapidly, but I, I believe the latest count is there are about uh, between 20 and 30 open slots remaining in New York City. That issue will be debated in the next uh, legislative session. Per pupil funding for charter schools in New York State is subject to legislative approval. While there is a formula in place that allows schools to predict what their per pupil income will be in each of the coming years, the legislature typically annually adds a supplemental amount to that uh, figure. So they, they adjust the number a bit, and that's a, that's a topic of debate each year in the state's budget uh, discussion. More recently in New York City, there's been a contentious debate over the placement of charter schools within Department of Education school buildings, a process called co-location in New York. This approach was used aggressively in the Bloomberg years, but much more sparingly in the first term of the de Blasio administration. So physical space remains a challenge for many, many charter schools in New York City, both new ones that are starting and established ones that are growing and adding grades. In the last year, Manhattan Institute scholars have produced reports relevant to the ongoing debate. Marcus Winters has summarized the existing research on the performance of charters in New York City, documenting a charter school advantage particularly on the state math test, but also on the state English language arts uh, test. Charles Som has produced an analytic report on the co-location issue, documenting the availability of space in Department of Education school buildings that could be used to accommodate new and growing charters. Both of these reports were generously supported by a grant from the Walton Family Foundation, to whom we are very grateful. The reports and others on education and charter schools are available on the Manhattan Institute website. We have a very distinguished panel assembled today and we are grateful to them for making their time to share their thoughts with us. For a number of years, the policy debate around the role of charters in New York City has been contentious. Many attempt to pit charters and traditional public schools against each other. Yet there is much to suggest that schools in both sectors share the same mission and the same challenges. Many families are engaged in both sectors at the same time or have students who move between the two sectors at different levels of schooling. These are not separate populations. Our panelists today have deep roots in the educational system, both in traditional district, district schools and system and with the charter schools. Prior to becoming deputy mayor, Richard founded a charter school in the city and served on the board of another. He now works with a major charter network. Shale and Chris both served in a variety of roles in Department of Education under Mayor Bloomberg. Chris went on to be state commissioner of education in New, York, uh, in New Jersey and superintendent of schools most recently in Newark, a city with a robust, char a robust charter sector. Shale now heads Bank Street College of Education. Lester Long is the founder and executive director of Classical Charter Schools, which opened its first school in 2006, I may have that wrong, and now operates four highly regarded K-8 schools in the South Bronx. The, uh, the format today is I'm going to pose some opening questions to each of the panelists, let them speak for a while, then we'll have some follow-up discussion, and of course we'll leave 
time at the end for questions from you, the audience. Richard, if I could ask you, what do you see as the proper role of charters in the overall educational enterprise in the city? What challenges do charter schools face as they continue to grow, and what can the city do to support them? Uh, well, first of all, good afternoon. I thought I bribed you to make me go last. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, good afternoon, and, and Ray, thank you, and all of you, thank you for having me. So. Uh, I think the question is, what is the role of charters mm -hmm. in the city? And, um, and then I heard, what can the well, city what can do, the city to, support? do to support, support them? So, look, I, I think fundamentally, I, I assume that everybody up here would answer some version of the same question. But I think mm -hmm. fundamentally what we're, uh, the point of charters in the city ultimately is to increase the number of high quality educational options for our children. It's just that simple, right? And I think there are two ways, at least, that we can think of how charters support that. One is by, uh, again, opening and running excellent schools. Uh, and two is by uh, being a part of the system in the locations where they are to contribute to the development and improvement of the systems more broadly. Uh, and I think in the ideal cities, where this, places where this works well, uh, charter schools are doing both of those things. Um, and so to go to the other question, you know, what can cities do to support charters? Um, I think it's the thing that allow you to open new seats and open new schools and the thing that allow you to have an opportunity to share best practice, to share learnings around the network. So that goes everything from, of course, uh, what is often the most critical uh, factor, which is uh, creating availability of space and accessibility of space to operate, because we know that um, the costs of private real estate can be debilitating. Um, and so certainly that's one of the key things you can do. But I think it goes beyond that. It's about creating an ecosystem, again, where charter schools really do have the opportunity to participate uh, in the system. If I think about my last four years in New York City, that included everything from making sure that charter schools were a part of some of the major initiatives we had, whether it was around uh, our pre-K for all expansion or our expansion of middle school after school programs, making sure that charters could be a part of programming like that but also being opening and wel open and welcoming to opportunities to collaborate. Uh, and I think there are some amazing examples of that happening in New York City. You know, and Common Schools has been doing some really incredible joint professional development with teachers in the city. Uh, KIPP uh, is uh, doing lots of knowledge sharing and training around college match and college placement and college persistence work. Uh, and so I think ultimately what we're trying to do is, uh, and you spoke to it, uh, we really need to get to a place that this operates as one system uh, a system which has multiple flavors, uh, but operates as one system. We've got a long way to go from here to there, but uh, for me, that's what my goal would be. Shell, it feels like I, I just met you, but it actually was 20 years ago. And in those years, you served at uh, every level of the school system. You were principal of a new uh, district high school in the South Bronx. You, uh, you went downtown and worked in the administration, various capabilities, ending up as deputy chancellor and now you're running a, a major teacher training and uh, educational research institution. Uh, Richard used the term best practices. From your various perspectives, what con contributions do charter schools make to the overall effort? Have you seen any innovations in either their approach to teaching and learning or in the ways in which they attract, train, and support their teachers? Thank you. It's good to be here with you all. Um, I want to zoom up to 50,000 feet for a second before I answer the question and, and just speak to some interesting research that I think is relevant to this conversation. Um, NCEE recently published a study looking at the talent systems in five high-performing countries around the world um, when you look at PISA scores. And so when, one of the things that they found in those systems um, is that there's dramatically less money spent outside of schools. Um, for example, Japan, I think, spends one-tenth um, on the structures that are in place to monitor and support schools at what we'd call the district level. Um, and that money is spent inside schools, for the most part. And it leads to very different kinds of instructional practices in these countries, where there's a lot more autonomy for educators within the schools and also a much more developed 
um, set of practices around improving the quality of instruction. And I share that because, in essence, in my mind, um, what charter schools represent is an attempt to disconnect from a pathology that exists in our um, school systems in the United States, which is because we don't trust educators and because most of the ways in which um, folks in government can see um, their way to making improvements involve new regulations. Um, we end up in a situation where we've constructed massive bureaucracies that suck up huge amounts of resources um, and do very little, actually, to control or support quality um, and end up, in fact, disrupting and um, forcing educators within schools to take their eye off the ball, which is how do we improve the quality of learning for the adults and the children in this building, um, and focus on any number of compliance mandates or other types of mandates. And so what the possibility and the innovation that I see in the charter sector is the opportunity to step outside of that box and actually use the resources that exist um, entirely for the purposes of supporting the schools as opposed to the, the many other things that grow up around a, a bureaucracy. And in order to take advantage of that, it's not, it's not sufficient to have that freedom. Like there's a bunch that you need to do successfully in order to take advantage of that freedom. Um, but I do think that kind of freedom is a prerequisite to solving the issues of equity that we have in our school systems. And charters are one angle on that. You can do this um, as we did in New York City under Mayor Bloomberg within the district as well. Uh, we created 600 schools. We dramatically shifted resources out of the central structure into schools, um, tried to promote more charter-like autonomies for district schools. Um, but it's a much purer ver version when the school organization is not actually governed by the school system. And so in terms of what is that produced in terms of outcomes or innovation, I think we can see a lot of different versions of what school can look like, from very traditional models that might look a lot like Catholic schools to very progressive models and everything in between. And what I take away from that is there isn't actually one right way to do school. Um, but when you have the focus and coherence and availability of resources directed around a clear mission, you move a lot faster and a lot farther. And that's the opportunity charters present. I'll give you one concrete example that's striking to me today in New York City. Most charter networks have some form of program where they train their own teachers. Um, and they usually do that through some form of teacher residency. And by teacher residency, I mean um, teachers are embedded with a master teacher for usually a year at least before they take on teaching themselves. Um, and that process of learning to teach in a really thoughtfully supported environment is also ubiquitous in almost all the private schools in New York City. Unfortunately, it's very, very rare in the K-12 system. The K-12 system, in fact, is doing something very different. It's investing in fast-track models where people get about two to four weeks of experience before they take on the responsibility of 30 children's lives. And we know how big of an impact each teacher can have. And so that, that to me, is part of many possible solutions that I think charters can invent. But it's an example of what happens um, when that that flexibility and freedom is there. Lester, on, on the ground uh, level, we hear a lot from charter school people in New York City that the biggest challenge they're facing these days is finding building space. Mm -hmm. You started with one school in the uh, South Bronx and now have four. My understanding is that some of these schools are co-located, others are in private uh, uh, space. How much has the uh, 
How much has the identification and availability of physical space been an issue for your network, and how have you, how have you handled sure. that? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's been massive. Um, I didn't think I was signing up for, for real estate uh, when I first envisioned uh, South Bronx Classical. Uh, the focus was on the classroom. The focus was on developing systems of data collection and analysis to uh, maximize teacher effectiveness. Um, it sort of changed a few years ago when um, it became clear that the city was no longer going to offer uh, space to uh, to charters um, and we won the blue ribbon in 2014 which was the first year that we got denied space uh, the national blue ribbon um, uh, so it's been difficult uh, you know building a 20 or 30 million dollar building is it's it's actually a job in itself it's architecture it's zoning it's the Department of Buildings it's it's so many things uh, I, I spend just last week an hour talking to people about how many um, what percentage of kids we expect to take the bus versus walk versus take a subway uh, versus take a city bus. Uh, all that zoning stuff is, is important. There's also the architectural part. So school leaders have definitely um, faced a shift in what they're thinking about now if they choose to grow. Um, further, uh, it's unclear what the future holds as far as what the mayor feels about school closure because I think the, the big problem is it doesn't seem like buildings are being built. So in the previous administration, weaker schools were, 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 were closed um, and that created space for other, uh, other schools. Since that stopped, now there's been a backlog of, I think, very deserving schools and, and educational organizations that are, are shut out. So we're sort of forced to either not grow or, um, or just jump into a, a, a very different world. Chris, I've left you for last, not simply because you're from New Jersey. <laughs> it's such a stigma, you know. But, uh, uh -huh. but uh, New Jersey has, a, uh, Newark, Newark has a very robust charter sector, and from this side of the river, it looks like in recent years, uh, it's perhaps gotten closer to what Richard described as operating as one system, all in the same business of educating uh, students. There's a unified application admission system in, in Newark. Uh, how has that worked? Is it something New York City cons yeah. should consider? And, and more generally, was the relationship between charters and district schools in Newark driven by the fact that in your time it was under state control uh, and now it's reverted to, to local control in Newark? Uh, can charters in Newark uh, survive that change? Have they attained a critical mass of enrollment that means that they will continue to have support? Thank you, and thanks very much uh, for having me here. Uh, thanks for uh, welcoming me, and I want to pay a special thanks to Charles, uh, whose work I've always uh, read with tremendous interest. Thank you, uh, Charles. Um, so uh, I have always operated under a v very sort of central value when it comes to charter schools, uh, and it is this, is that um, uh, we should be essentially quality focused and governance indifferent um, uh, when it comes to public schools. We should demand that they be open to all, that they be free, that they be governed by uh, a, uh, an entity that uh, owes its life to or has oversight by democratically elected uh, uh, organizations, um, uh, and they'd be subject to the same sort of civil rights laws that any other public institution um, is. And if you sort of start with that uh, as the test about whether a school is public uh, and you say what we really are here to do is to make sure that every child regardless of birth circumstances is given a fair shot through the catalytic force of a quality education to have access to the good life however you want to define it the American dream or or, or wherever then you stop being focused on what the politicians want you to focus on, which is a, is a school, a magnet school, a traditional school, a neighborhood school, uh, or, a char or, or a charter school. So that basic philosophy is something that Shale and I, I think, were imbued with in our, during our respective terms as deputy chancellor in, uh, in New York City. Um, and it's something I carried with me into all the work um, I have done uh, that uh, that that follows, um, and as a result, by the way, when I was commissioner, I closed 15% of the charter schools 
in, uh, in, in New Jersey because they weren't meeting the deal. Uh, we give you greater autonomy and you get greater um, uh, uh, in exchange for real, uh, real accountability. Um, so um, in, in, in Newark, and I do think this would not have happened, Ray, to your question, without the benefit of the continuity associated with state control. Um, we basically had that philosophy at the center of, 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 of what we did. Um, and so since 2010, we went from about 9% of the kids attending a charter schools in Newark to about 35% of the kids attending charter schools in Newark. I always, always, always reported our achievement data is as aggregate data, not n charters versus district. But if you're a child in Newark and you go to a public school, are you doing better or, or worse? And it's, tr it's absolutely true that the charters were doing better than the traditional schools, but so were the traditional schools uh, improving. So part of it is, is that. And we also facilitated a kind of unity of approach through this common enrollment system. And what does that mean? That is the district took control of student assignments. No more lotteries, right? Every child was no longer consigned to his or her neighborhood school, but prioritized uh, the school they wanted to go to, including charter schools, including traditional schools, then there was a neutral algorithm that decided whether uh, that child would get their choice or which choice that, that child uh, would get. Was all of this done without rancor? I can certainly not report that. Um, uh, uh, I can tell you, though, that um, the um, sort of charter sector is embedded deeply into the sort of landscape and framework of the city, and regardless of the return to local control or the ebbing and flowing of some sometimes interesting local politics, there will not be a retreat from that. And I say that in part uh, because I, uh, I think it's probably a bad idea to invoke Machiavelli in any event, um, but, uh, but uh, there is uh, something that he said uh, deep in the prints that I've always thought was very useful, which is that the, those who defend the status quo um, always have a significant advantage over those who are trying to change the status quo, because the defenders of the status quo can point to what is, and those who want to change it um, can uh, only point to what might be, and they don't have the money, the interest, et cetera, to, that to defend the bulwarks against, against change. Well, what has happened in both New York City and in Newark is that through a lot of hard work and some very interesting politics, the status quo got changed, right? And while you saw in the last administration um, uh, uh, at, at, the new, at the Department of Education here, the, um, the last chancellor, a lot of unwinding of things like accountability and, um, uh, and the like, it was almost impossible to unwind the growth and the, uh, of charter schools because there were natural constituencies that had been developed, parents, elected officials, um, um, uh, et cetera. And I would say that for all of the bumpiness of the work that happened in Newark, A, we got fantastically great academic results, and B, we now have a constituency that wants to defend those, including defending the advent of the charter schools. Um. Good. Uh, I have a question, a number of questions I'm gonna pose mm -hmm. to the panel about uh, high schools. It's a very contentious issue in New York City right now, a very robust debate going on. For those of you who are not familiar with the details of how charter schools grow in New York City, uh, typically they working? start with the first grade, you know, kindergarten if they're an elementary school, fifth grade if they're a middle school, ninth grade if they're a high school, and they grow year by year. And so for that reason, the enrollment in charter schools in the city is skewed towards the lower grades. But there are a number of charter high schools and their numbers are growing and their enrollment is growing as the population reaches the high school years. On the district side, you're all aware, uh, there are many fine high schools, not limited to the eight selective or exam schools that are in the press these days. And the city is currently involved in a robust debate about fairness and excellence in the high schools. What's the role of charters in that discussion? They serve what is considered a typically underserved, the underserved communities. The, some of the charter school high schools are, are getting uh, uh, great results. Um, uh, I'll start with Lester. Your net network operates K-8 to schools and is producing high results. What does the high school sector look like for your graduates? Where are they going mm -hmm. to high school? And do you think there are enough high-performing schools, either district or charter, for them? That's a good question. So um, uh, you can hear me better? 
so uh, we were originally a K to five, um, and what we found was we graduated, I think, three years worth of fifth graders who were not going to spectacular uh, middle schools. A, the, the children are you know 11, so they can't travel, and B, frankly, there's just a dearth of high-performing middle schools anywhere in the city, but certainly in the South Bronx. So um, we expanded our charter to go from K to five to K to eight um, under the hope that we will be able to um, have our uh, scholars or our children gain access to high performing high schools, which actually do exist. We can name the great high schools. Um, rather than thinking about building a high school, which we don't plan on doing anytime soon, uh, we instead focus a lot of energy and time in getting uh, our scholars access to those high performing high schools that exist. I'm happy to report that currently uh, this year, uh, our eighth grade, 10% of our eighth graders are going to specialized schools. Uh, another 10% are going to uh, high performing private and independent schools. Um, I'm a data guy, so forgive me, but uh, the local high schools, uh, this, the three high schools closest to um, where I work um, have a a four-year graduation rate of 58%. So that's 58% of the ninth graders make it uh, through to the 12th grade and graduate. Um, our scholars end up um, having an average, attend schools that have an average four-year graduation rate of 93%. So that's a su substantially different outcome for them. Mm -hmm. Richard, your network, KIPP, was among the earliest charter operators in the city to open a high school. You've been at it for quite some time. How does that school fit into the current discussion about equity and, and fairness in, in excellence and creating greater opportunities for young people in the city? Well, I, I would go back to what I said before, right? I mean, I think our ultimate goal here is to create a number of quality options for young people that includes creating more high school options for young people, and obviously charter schools, uh, as Chris said, is a mechanism fundamentally for creating new schools. And so uh, I, I do think it is relevant to the debate about specialized high schools in New York for a couple of reasons. Um, and I, I don't want to get us off too topic, I know that's not the central topic, but uh, you know, I think at the center of the debate around the specialized high schools is you know, whether we want to accept it or not, a debate around what are the capabilities of black and Latino students, and can black and Latino students achieve in competitive environments? And though the answer to that question uh, is or should be obvious, it is unfortunately, uh, if you read the message boards of the specialized high school alumni networks, a question that apparently is still open for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so some of the reaction to the change in the test is so irrational because um, I think, I think too many of us are having struggling to come to terms with the fact that there are thousands of black and Latino students around the country who get, good, certainly in our city, who get good grades, can perform well on standardized tests, and can absolutely achieve in those schools. So I, I think one thing that schools like our KIPP High School in the South Bronx show is that we stand, uh, we operate now I think 30 high schools around the country, one in New York City. Um, we are living proof of the ability of our young people. And again, I hate to say it this way because this is not something I feel any uh, need to prove. Um, but we stand as an example of what young people can accomplish if they are given uh, the space to do so. Uh, so I support certainly uh, the expansion and the opening up of admissions at the specialized high schools in part because the current process is just so rational. I mean, no, no elite institution manages admissions that way. It just, it's just not, it's not a rational way to make decisions in that regard. Um, and so I think it's important to open up those schools uh, by having admissions processes that are more likely to uh, have more talent participate. At the same time, we are still talking about about three or 4,000 high school seats. Um, so at the same time, as, as incredibly important as that work is, and I think it's incredibly important, uh, Obviously, that is not the sole answer to what it takes to get young people on the path to college and careers. Uh, and so um, I think charter schools play a big role in this because, again, it is an opportunity to allow folks to create new educational opportunities for young people, which when managed well and was done well, we know and we see every day can lead to extraordinary results for children. Can I add a couple thoughts? Sure. Um, so one, I think there's an interesting um, thing that might occur should the mayor's proposal on the specialized high schools 
be approved, which is that there would be a significant advantage to students like Leicester students coming out of um, the high performing charters around the city. Um, you'd see a lot more um, of those students gain access to that system of schools under this proposal because charter schools are predominantly um, African American, Latino, and they tend to outperform on the state exams. Um, so I think that that's an interesting um, observation. And at the same time, this is really a symbolic question. Um, as Richard said, this is just a few thousand of our high school seats. And the real work around equity in high schools is not going to be solved either through the very small charter sector in the high schools or the um, specialized schools. And the notion that the specialized schools are in some way the pinnacle of education in this city is ridiculous. Um, there, there's a, a whole host of other really innovative, powerful high school models that have been developed, particularly over the last 15 years, that give students access to a great education. And I think one of the lesser told stories um, in these discussions is how much of that innovation grew out of um, the, the Bloomberg administration's initiatives to replace failing schools with smaller schools. Mm -hmm. um, and from that work, we saw dropout rates cut in half, um, graduation rates rise by 20 points, college readiness rates double. And all of that is like a small step towards where you ultimately would like to be in terms of performance. But it is actually, if you look around the country in secondary school reform, it's the only place where you've seen systemic change at scale in secondary reform. And MDRC did a very rigorous study um, that compared achievement of students entering these different schools over time and found really dramatic and statistically significant gains at a level that, you know, if you know education research, usually you're really excited to get a small marginal um, gain. And most, most educational interventions are not getting any statistically significant gain. Um, this was such a powerful intervention um, that it really changed the face of student performance in the city. And so I think that is an indicator of what's possible when you unleash creativity and talent amongst um, teachers and principals. And I, I actually would welcome um, the charter sector taking uh, a bolder and more active um, step into this arena, because I think that it's been largely missing from the it high school been. arena. Yeah. Yeah, can I reiterate, I just want to reiterate the point, uh, because I think it bears repeating, and I, I want to give kudos to my colleagues from the Bloomberg administration, uh, from someone who's an alumnus of the de Blasio administration. I think what you just said is very important. I think it is truly one of the undertold stories. It, it, for me, it's something I just experienced very personally. I'm a graduate of the specialized high schools. I'm a graduate of Stuyvesant. Uh, and I just went through the admissions process for my son, who's just finishing his ninth grade, his first year at Brooklyn Technical High School. Uh, the amount of quality options that were available to my son uh, it just, just dwarf by any measure the amount of uh, quality options that were available to me. And it's part of what makes the conversation about the specialized high schools so absurd right now, exactly what Shale's talking about. Some of the discussion is sort of, I think, embedded in a world where there are only three places where your kids can go to high school. Um, but that's also not the reality of the city right now. And so I, I, I think it's another example of where, and it's definitely relevant to our conversation around charters and the future of charters in the city, it's another example about where the rhetoric and the anger and the emotions around education are entirely disconnected from the reality on the ground. Uh, and if we could find a way to remove some of that heat uh, from the conversation, it would be much easier to get to rational conclusions. Uh, but, but we are still in this place where um, just the level of dialogue is so, is so toxic and getting worse. Uh, it just makes it difficult to have rational right. conversations about 
which are really sort of straightforward policy questions that can often have straightforward solutions. So if I can just jump in on the high school one uh, uh, very quickly. I mean, there, there are a couple things that are usually not said out loud about high schools. One is, as a country, right, we are much less successful in high schools than we are in elementary and middle, and you see that in the NAEP results and in, in, in the other one. The second is that overwhelmingly, and I bet you this is true of half the people here, high school was a relatively miserable experience uh, in which you were not terribly engaged, you felt talked to, you were focusing on, on, on other things. So the design of high schools really calls for sort of a radical relook uh, and innovation. And the last and the politically most complicated one is, uh, is that there's a huge amount of sorting that goes on among children before they get to high school, regardless of the specialized um, issue that is so topical uh, today. What do I mean by that? Well, how many people do you know in your circle who say, well, the public schools are good enough in elementary, but we gotta, we gotta do something by the time we get to junior or high school, and then they move to Westchester or another leafy suburb or find a private school option. And the same is uh, true uh, of those who participate in sort of the magnet schools, the specialized schools, exam schools sort of writ large, if I can't get into, and it doesn't need to be Stuyvesant, but if I can't get into a good school, and, and, and I'm so glad that Shale and others have echoed the point that there are many, many more quality high school options now because of a lot of very brave things that happened during the, during the, during the Bloomberg years. But f for the most part, it is true that there are fewer quality high school options in this city and any city, frankly, than there are quality elementary and middle school options. And that's something, that's sort of a starting point of this. And I would echo the view that charters have been, I would say for the most part as a class, the opposite of brave when it comes to addressing that uh, reality. Much more typical models, we'll start with a fifth grade, we'll grow to a sixth grade, we'll cap out at an eighth grade, or we'll start with a first and go to a fourth, because it's frankly easier uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. So I would very much welcome the advent of new approaches to high school led by uh, not only charters, but uh, other sort of education um, entrepreneurs and, and innovators. So in thinking about a yeah. new generation mm -hmm. of high schools, I'm mm -hmm. struck by the fact that it would seem that in the last 20 years of educational reform in this country, the focus has almost been solely on college preparation. All of our mm -hmm. metrics now are tied to our children on the way to being prepared for college. Graduation rates have risen in high schools, but college readiness remains a major concern. Have we made too much of a single focus on college prep? Can high schools with other goals fit into this notion of diversity of offerings? Uh, can they fit into the array of options? Uh, is that, you know, can we do more in the area of career and technical education or just general preparation for adulthood? Nationwide, uh, fewer than 40% of the population uh, successfully complete either an associate's or bachelor's degree. And so while we work to increase that number, should we be also offering other options? Well, I would first of all uh, confirm the point that you know we sort of have this lovely elision. We say college and career readiness, and we sort of mean college, but we throw in career because it sort of sounds right. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and I also think that we are still sort of imbued with a sort of value of a sort of general liberal arts education. That because uh, you know some of us grew up in an era where there was shop and home ec and auto mechanics uh, and so on, and that was kind of a second tier. Uh, and that is very different from what you see in Germany and many other successful OECD countries that does, I'll use the word sorting again, at least ask children to start to self-identify or be identified as appropriate for a particular career uh, tr uh, track. So I do think uh, in defense of the sort of myth that we perpetuated that um, overwhelmingly to be successful in a career actually requires that you be competent at mathematics and at reading and at critical thinking and at writing. And so there is a real convergence of college readiness and career readiness. But I think if we do this right, that convergence is largely acquired by the end of the 10th grade. And I think there's a real argument, and certainly in Newark, uh, where I last was um, posted, um, giving kids, giving a, uh, kids uh, a significantly larger number of kids an opportunity for a career and preparing them for that uh, would have been incredibly well received by parents and children and probably would have made for richer and better lives than living the illusion that everybody is uh, being prepared for a four-year undergraduate institution. So this could go on 
Can I just add two points on um, sort of two good examples of of this career and tech education that I think are really vibrant in the city. Um, Richard Kahn's here from Urban Assembly. That network of schools partners with industry to create career and tech models. Um, very successful. Also, the P Tech model, mm -hmm. um, which started with IBM and is now spread across the country, um, is uh, a six through fourteen model or nine through fourteen model. So kids get an associate's degree when they graduate. Um, both of those types of approaches, where there's really strong ind industry partnership involved um, in the design of the school, um, have proven to be really successful. And I think that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Can I cheat with a quick asterisk? I'm sorry. Um, so I, I think that's all right, but I, I would just put a, an asterisk on the conversation, and maybe it's a two-part asterisk. One is, uh, although I agree with everything that was just said, it's also the case that uh, the country continues to place a heavy premium on a college degree. Mm -hmm. And so as we have these conversations, we also have to, we have to prepare for the future, but also deal with the now. And, mm -hmm. um, and the second asterisk there I want to put there is I think sometimes I think for many of us who, uh, all of us in this room who care about justice and equity, part of the appeal about a college for all as a mission is our concern about who gets to decide which children get to go to college and who doesn't. When, it, when that decision is made, is it made in kindergarten, is it made in the womb, is it made in fifth grade, is it made in ninth grade? So I think as we have this conversation, we also have to be very careful that if we're talking about choices, mm -hmm. we're talking about actual choices, actual informed choices, all of which lead to the opportunity to lead fulfilling and choice-filled lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we still live in a world where racism affects uh, every aspect of our being. It affects our classroom. It affects the expectations that we have for the students in our classrooms. And so we have to be aware of that as we make mm -hmm. decisions about the kind of system that we create and one that actually leads to opportunities for everyone because at the best high schools at KIPP, you know, I think we have great high schools. Uh, most of our kids are not graduating with four-year degrees around the country. And so we, we have to have an answer for those students, but we have to make sure that it is an answer that is grounded in equity and, and realizes the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've all been very uh, uh, patient. Uh, questions from the floor? Yes. Howard. Yes. <laughs> Howard Husick, Manhattan Institute. Shell Sharansky was the only one who mentioned teacher training. And for the president of Bank Street College, you were very complimentary about an on what we call a residence training or on the job training, if you will. What's the relationship between charters and education reform and a school like yours? Or could, I, I know that Richard used to run a really interesting organization called the Children's Aid Society. Could those social workers make the transition into teaching just by being resident teachers? Well, most good teacher residency programs combine that on the job um, mentored practice with a theoretical foundation. And it's that connection between the two that is what I would say the strongest predictor of whether someone sticks with the, with the job of teaching, over, over half of our teachers across the country leave in their first three years, and we spend almost $3 billion a year replacing those teachers. Um, so there's clearly a massive failure in the teacher education market right now. Um, and a lot of that is because we aren't investing in combining meaningful clinical practice with um, a strong theoretical foundation. And so, yeah, a social worker could become um, trained in that way, but it's not, what I'm suggesting is that it's not um, as simple as skipping um, the, the sort of theoretical foundation. You actually have to know how brain development works, um, and you have to think about the connections between that and your lived experience in order to become an excellent teacher. Um, I think a good example of the charter sector's work in this arena is the creation of Relay Graduate School of Education, which grew out of a partnership between KIPP Achievement First and Uncommon, and is a really stellar graduate school of education that is very tightly aligned with the instructional model in those schools, um, and, is, and is invested in combining the sort of classroom learning that those aspiring teachers do with 
uh, clinical practice experience um, that connects the dots. A really bad example of this is the recent change that um, SUNY made in the regulations, um, which basically allow for um, charters to have teacher training models that can have as little as 40 hours of classroom practice. Um, so that's basically about a week um, of classroom practice that the state is now requiring um, under those guidelines, and that's a joke. And so I think, you know, if, if we're serious about this, we need to combine the two, and we need to pay attention to the economic incentives within the market, um, which are currently oriented towards fast and cheap. Um, and fast and cheap doesn't get you very far in terms of teacher quality. I just want to add ver one very quick point. I think one of the most devastating statistics in public, edu in public education is in the realm of teacher training, and it, it is, we, we did, when we were uh, in, working in New York City, we did a pathway analysis. In other words, can you determine the impact on student outcomes based on the pathway a teacher took to the career? Teach for America, teaching fellows, traditionally trained, et cetera. And one thing we did not find, by the way, uh, is that Teach for America teachers were um, like smoking traditionally trained teachers or altered teachers or so on. We found actually that basically they were doing just about as well in reading and maybe marginally very small better, uh, better in math. I'm not making a point about Teach for America, but the point I'm making is that not that they were doing better, but it is astonishing that they were doing as well as teachers who had spent, in many cases, many years learning to be a teacher. So that, I think there is a message in that, that whatever we are doing, and I echo the, the, the value of residency programs and the, the extraordinary power of the, relay, of the relay program, but what we are doing as a class in teacher training, not at Bank Street, I happily carve out that exception, uh, is just not working based on that particular statistic I just cited. I'll get a few more people a chance. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, hi, Nicholas Sishuk from Bed Study Beginnings Charter School in Brooklyn. Um, years ago, the Gates Foundation put together the District Charter Compact, which has sort of got the ball rolling on these conversations, and the city's stepped up with District Charter Collaborative under the current mayor. Um, I'm going to use a charter term. What's the BHAG? What's the big, hairy, ambitious goal? for charter schools and district schools working together? What is the, the most peak vision of what, say, 10 years from now this looks like? So if Relay is the contribution for graduate school, for teacher training, what are all the other pieces look like? And kind of how can we can make people in this room or other people in the sector make that happen? I mean, speaking on the ground, I think what I'd like to see is co-location equal collaboration. Um, I, I go get in very early in the morning every day with teachers from other schools and there's sort of this strange uh, semi-awkward um, wall. Um, I sometimes nearly beg uh, the principals to attend our professional development sessions where they're literally you know, one floor up uh, and it's been uh, really difficult. I would love to see uh, a reduction in that anxiety and that awkwardness by you know, we're all educators, we're all going in the same building. We happen to offer, I think, uh, strong teacher development in-house. Um, attend, pull up a chair. Uh, but it's been, it's been, I don't know if it's overly politicized, I don't know why, but it's actually difficult for me to get uh, uh, principals and teachers from other co-located schools to attend our professional development. And I don't know if it's things that, you know, it's a narrative, I don't know if it's the greater narrative that they're struggling with, but. I would love to be a part of that. Is there, there's a hand in the back there. Sorry. Hi, hi, my name is Peter Goodman. I do a blog called Ed and the Apple. Um, we live in an environment where it's public schools versus charter schools. And there's a lot of animosity back and forth. In the waning years of Bloomberg, which Cher was involved, we had empowerment schools and networks, and we seem to be moving towards a different way of running schools, which has fallen apart now. Do you envision any management structures which include public schools and charter schools, and maybe even parochial schools, in some collaborative model that would operate throughout the city? I mean, when we started the autonomy zone back um, in 2004, 
2005, we actually, the first network did include charter schools um, for the purposes of this kind of collaboration and learning. Um, and, you know, as that scaled, it, it wasn't the primary focus and it didn't really scale up along with all the other elements. Um, I, I would say the, this idea of district schools and charter schools learning from each other is probably the wrong place to put your energy. And here's why. Um, there's a tremendous gravitational pull um, when you're in a school towards what is happening in that school. And the work of a school is to figure out how to make coherent the instructional model with the culture of the adults and students in that school and the way time and other resources are used. And that is a very different set of questions from school to school. Um, it is very, very rare that via either professional development or the documentation of best practices that knowledge spreads from one school to another and is adapted. The primary way that change actually happens in schools is when someone who's lived in a high-performing school culture, public or um, charter, actually goes to another school having lived that having seen it fail and succeed under different conditions and learn to adapt in that context, then some of those practices can shift if there's someone carrying that who has that experience. And so probably a much more productive way if we're really serious about sharing across these two sectors would be to think about how do people move um, over time? Like are there leadership development programs for teacher leaders um, that lead folks from one sector into another in order to actually build some of those practices. And that, that does happen in individual cases, but I can't point to any systemic example of that anywhere. One sort of quick thing that comes to mind, it's a, it's a really interesting um, perspective. I mean, I, I think one, one thing that I would also throw out there is I think actually the way that the pre-kindergarten works in New York City Pre-kindergarten includes charter schools, uh, religious schools, private schools, district schools, all operating under the identical structure. I mean, there, there's no real difference in how those programs are supported based on the way the schools are defined. I, it's too early to have any, to really understand what impact that has or whether it has any lessons for the broader system. But it's an example of where I think what you're describing actually exists on the ground in New York City. Um, and, and I know we're running out of town, but I, I think you know, time. But I think a lot of these questions do come back to when we think about what's next. I do think a lot of these questions ultimately come back to uh, the politics and the state of discourse around these issues. And I think whatever whatever challenge we're describing, until we uh, find a productive way forward that involves different communications, different politics, different relationships, I do think it will be very hard to even answer some of these difficult questions because there won't be. There isn't the will or the openness to actually come together and to see what could work uh, because people aren't willing to work together. Yes, right here. Here we are. No, you. Hi, my name is Wei Min Trung. I'm with Empire State Development, but I'm also a co-founder of um, Bronx Global Learning Institute for Young Girls. I uh, wanted to ask a question about the potential possibility of creating a new type of high school that kind of uh, takes on the model of Swiss apprenticeships, where kids go to school two days and have three days of actual industry labor work. They actually learn a tool and trade, and that they have a funnel career path and pathway that goes into a job that is not um, in competition with college graduate down the road and then they have a return path back to college to get their final degree if they like to, they have an option. I've seen that work really well in Switzerland, for example, and I've seen how their earning income to potential in a lifetime span is not uh, behind or in terms of um, what they can get out of that path, and I think it works well. So for our future uh, challenges of AI and machine learning and all that, I'm thinking as an economic development specialist, that would be a way to combine both industry, a P3 model, into education, if that's the case. I just want to get your take on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think absolutely. And, and uh, I think we've said before, I think that charters could be in the lead of that work and haven't been. I, I feel like inside Kit, there's sort of two streams of work going on in for high school right now. There is a stream of work that is about improving the quality of our high schools. And there is certainly a stream of work about thinking about what high schools should look like. 
uh, and what needs to be different. And we're trying to move forward on both those pathways at once. Uh, but very much in light of what you described, trying to think about uh, how to make those connections stronger and, and do it in partnership with industry. Um, I think there are some great examples out there, some of which Shale mentioned, but uh, I think that we certainly uh, can, I think could certainly do more, and I think other institutions could do more as well. I would add that there's an example of this in the Catholic school world, the Crystal right now, where <laughs> kids go to apprenticeships one day a week, they get paid, that offsets their tuition, but it is also a college pro a program that they're going to use involved in the world of work. Any other uh, questions? Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.